It's the Q. Here is your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We are on the ground at Santa Clara Convention Center at the Open Daylight Summit. It's the second year they've had the show. About 800 people talking everything software-defined networking. And we're excited to uh, have our next guest coming all the way across the Pacific to be on theCUBE. David Jorm, Senior Manager Product Security from IAX. Welcome. Yeah, it's great to be here. So this must be a really big event for you to come all the way over here. It is, it's huge. I mean, Open Daylight Summit, like you said, it's only the second one. The number of attendees here is amazing. So to have the opportunity to come here and hear everything that's going on in the SDN space is a really good opportunity. So IAX is an exciting new company. We, uh, we covered the Pure.2.0 conference last year. So for the folks that aren't familiar with IAX, give them a little background. Yeah, so IAX, we're calling it the Software Defined Interconnect Company. So I guess people listening to this probably know about Software Defined networking, probably know what that's about. The idea is applying the sort of concepts behind software defined networking to establishing connections between different networks. So think about you've got a couple of big network operators, maybe you've got AT&T or Verizon, and then you've got maybe Google or Facebook or LinkedIn that serves a lot of content to those networks and they'd like to establish a direct connection from one network to the other so that an eyeball network could consume all the content from say a cloud service provider. And we're automating the process of provisioning those connections. So that's what we're calling software-defined interconnect. And I don't think a lot of people understand quite how much peer-to-peer -peer stuff is going on in most of the content that they consume every day. It's, it's huge, and we're trying to actually shy away from the term peer-to-peer -peer because it's overloaded. If you speak to people about peer-to-peer, -peer, they say, oh, so like sharing video media or so on. You say, no, 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 that's one kind of peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. But peering, and what we're calling direct interconnect, is huge. So it's where two networks connect to each other and exchange traffic without traversing the public internet. And that's actually how the core of the internet is formed. If you look at all the big network providers, the way that they actually interchange data with each other is by going into an internet exchange point and directly connecting. It's a kind of hidden ecosystem, but it's actually at the core of how the internet functions. And your specialty is security. So you're here, you're giving a talk on security, world-class security. Yep. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what you're going to be uh, speaking about for the folks that aren't going to make your session. Certainly. So back in December 2014, I first started to get involved with the Open Daylight Project. And uh, back then, it was kind of more in its infancy, and there were some security issues. There were some vulnerabilities that had been published, and there were no patches. Nobody was kind of uh, cottoning on to the fact that these security issues existed. This is in open daylight. This is in open daylight. Okay. So I came in you know, as a security guy saying, ah, OK, we need to fix this. So I established the Open Daylight Security Response Team, documented a process, had that process ratified by the TSC, and now we're executing it. So we have a really solid security response process that's in place. If you report a vulnerability in Open Daylight, we can keep it private, we can coordinate disclosure, we can ship a patch, um, that's all there. The next step though is actually getting ahead of the game and uh, establishing some proactive efforts. How can we reduce the risk of there being security vulnerabilities in the future? And that's what my presentation this year is going to be all about. So it's interesting, you know, the power uh, of, of a foundation like this where you as an individual, I assume you're an individual, you know, can spot something that's, that's a significant problem and really kind of jump in with both feet and not only make a contribution but really set a trend in an ongoing effort to plug that hole. Yeah, and I was actually really amazed by how welcoming the community was. I've participated in open source communities before. I worked for Red Hat for five years, so I'm very familiar with how it works. And a lot of open source communities are actually a little bit confrontational, particularly if you say something that's potentially negative. Hey, you've got a problem with security here. A lot of people will become very defensive. They won't want to let you contribute. But the Open Daylight community was really uh, welcoming, and they just said, great, yeah, can you help us? Tell us how to do it. And so I, I, it was a great opportunity, yeah. So it's interesting, so then what lessons can you share with the Open Daylight community based on your old Red Hat experience to make sure that this, this, this project you know, stays on track, doesn't get forked, you know, we always hear about you know, conflicts between kind of management and direction and forking and you know, there's all kind of things that can go sideways. Yep. What are some of the really keys for, the, for Open Daylight to really stay on track and continue to deliver a lot of value to its members? That's a great question. I'd say from my perspective, two things. The first is keeping it open, open to collaboration. So that speaks to the experience I had back in December. Everybody was really welcoming. They said, just tell us how you'd like to do this. We'll review your process and we'll implement it. There was no barrier, there were no egos, so we need to keep that. The other is keeping it vendor neutral because otherwise you'll have a situation where a vendor wants a particular feature for their business reasons. That won't be accepted upstream, so they'll fork. And, and if we can keep it vendor neutral, we'll, we'll avoid that problem as well. Okay, so 
what are you working on next? What's the next great, uh, great hurdle to, uh, to overcome? Yeah, so like I said, the, the next step is to actually try and get ahead of the game and do some proactive security work. So I've actually got an intern that's working with me through the Open Daylight Summer Internship Project, and he's nearly finished that. So what he's implemented is a bunch of automated checks and balances in the build system. So when you kick off a build, it will actually automatically inspect the code, looking for patterns of vulnerabilities. It'll look at the dependency tree and see whether any of the packages that you're bringing in have a known vulnerability. And if it sees them, it will fail the build. So this will allow us to automatically detect at least some of the security issues before they enter a, a stable build of Open Daylight. Okay, excellent. And uh, I think we can say save the date. There's a big save the date coming up for IX there later is, this fall. Yep. Uh, so so can we see? Can we see? We gonna see you there? Yeah, I'll be there September 9th at the San Francisco Masonic Center. Save the date. It's gonna be exciting. One more time. What date? September 9th. September 9th. Yeah. Okay. Save the date. The cube will be there. Dave will be there. A bunch of people will be there. Al will be there. Will will be there. Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks for stopping by, and uh, good luck on your talk tomorrow. Fantastic. Thank and you. Uh, I'm Jeff Frick. This is David Jorm. You're watching the Cube. We're at Open Daylight Summit.